Luke chapter number 22. We'll start reading in verse number 31. Luke chapter number 22, verse number 31. If you have your place, shout a big amen. amen. Be glad you saved, shout a big amen. 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 The Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let's read that one more time. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I want to preach on a simple thought this morning. The Lord gave me on the desire of Satan. A lot of times in church you'll hear about the desire of the Lord and the desire of God's people. But this morning I'm going to display to you the actual desire of Satan for each and every single one of you. Father, we love you. We thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done in this service. We thank you, God, for those that have showed up this morning to worship you. And God, Lord, for the next little while, God, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Anoint my lips of clay. Help me preach, Lord. I know I can't do it without you. And I pray that you'd come down and fill me. Lord, empty me of sin and self and fill me, Lord, with your good spirit and power from on high. God, don't, don't let me speak, Lord, with just uh, wisdom and words, God, but let me preach, Lord, with authority uh, of the Holy Ghost this morning. We do love you. Do thank you. Go with each one. God, let this message rest upon their soul. Help them, encourage them, strengthen them, save them, whatever. God, it's intended, Lord, to do. I pray that your message would get to your people this morning. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we ask and we do pray. Amen. Amen. You be seated. Now, if you're a Bible studier and you've studied the Bible much, you really not even a whole bunch, you'll realize that, that the person that he's talking to when he says Simon, he's talking to Peter. In the Bible, you'll find that, that, that Peter's name originally was Simon. It was not Peter. But the Lord changed Simon's name to Peter. If you'll study the Bible, there's been many times that the Lord, after somebody's been converted or saved, that he'll change their name, give them a different name. You know Saul turns into Paul, so on and so forth, just as Peter was here when the Lord uh, saved him and brought him in to be a fisherman of men. Uh, the Lord began to change his name from what was Simon to Peter. After this point, Peter has been in the ministry of the Lord for quite some time. He's not wet behind the ears. He's seasoned. He's a seasoned disciple. And the Lord has been using Peter in a great and mighty way. But as I begin to study this text and read it out in the beginning, it really struck out to me because Terry, I could not understand. Uh, I understand why the Lord's telling Peter this. He wants to warn him about what the devil wants to do in his life. But I could not for the life of me understand why the Lord would refer back to his sinful name why he would refer back to Simon. Why didn't he say Peter? Peter, behold, Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat. Why did the Lord say Simon, Simon? I began to study a little bit and I found out that the word Simon basically means look or listen. And, and so if you take that, that interpretation, the Lord says, look, listen, behold. Is what he's telling uh, 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 Peter. He's trying to get his attention. But furthermore than that, I believe that the Lord's trying to send a secret message to Peter. See what the Lord is doing right now with Peter's life. He's beginning to warn him about the wiles of the devil. He's about to warn him about the plan uh, that the devil has against him. He's, he's, he's devouring him. He's trying to sift him. It's what the Lord's trying to get him to understand. See what you don't realize is the Lord knows 10,000 years ahead of us. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen in Wall Street. 
treaties know what's going to happen in the stocks. He knows what will happen in the presidency. He'll know what will happen in this church before each and every one of us even do. He knows it all. He sees it all. He's created it all. So the Lord knew the, the fight that Peter was about to face and he was trying to warn him. And when he says, Simon, Simon, I believe that the Lord is trying to tell Peter uh, that the devil does not see you as Peter. He does not see you as my disciple. He does not see you as a good Christian boy, but he sees you for who you were and what you used to do. And he's going to take those things and fight it against you. I want to tell you this morning that Satan has a desire. And when he looks at you, he does not see the good Christian girl. He does not see the good Christian boy. He doesn't see your title, your position, or how many times you've read your Bible this week. But he sees you for who you used to be before God saved you. And he's going to use everything that you used to do against you to try to test you and try you and tempt you. And, and the Lord is trying to get Peter to see and to realize that now I believe Peter's starting to get pride for it. I believe that Peter's starting to think I am somebody because I'm a disciple of the Lord. But I believe the Lord is trying to get him off of his high horse and realize that you can never get too high, that you can't fall because the devil's always prowling and he's always after you. Here in the text we find the plan of Satan. 31 says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan have desire to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. It was very particular when I read this verse of scripture, because not only does the Lord warn Peter that the devil's going to fight him, but he warns Peter in, in such a way that he tells Peter the exact plan against him. The plan was simple. That Satan had a desire. You ever had a desire to do something? I, I, I've had a desire uh, to do this or to do that. Some of you, when you were young, you had a desire to grow up and be a good baseball, basketball player. And you would stop at nothing to reach your desire. That's what the Lord's saying about the devil. He had a desire inside of him that he wanted Peter bad. Nothing was going to stop him. Everything in him was going to try his best to get Peter. And not only to have him, as he said, Satan hath the desire to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. The devil's plan, and, and, and if you don't hear anything else in this message, hear this. That the devil's plan against your life is not fragile. It is not a plan that came and was unthink. It's not a plan that was, he didn't, he didn't think about it. It was a plan that way before you ever knew was coming, the devil was somewhere back looking and watching and planning against your life. That's why I always preach faithfulness. That's why I always preach be on top of your game spiritually at all times because you never know when the devil's going to pick you next. The plan of Satan, the plan of Satan was very simple, that he was going to try to get Peter. He was going to try to have him. And I'm going to say this, that this morning if you're saved and blood-bought, you're, you're you don't belong to the devil. When the Lord saved you, you belong to him. But right then and there, the devil began his plan to get you back. In this day and hour, especially in the New Testament, when the, when the Lord begins to uh, talk about the things that would happen in the last days, he talked about there'll be a great falling away. And what preacher, what is that? That's the devil's plan succeeding against people's life. I could sit this morning and go name by name of the people I used to worship with. I mean, I'm talking strong, spiritual people that are sitting in the house this morning probably with a hangover because they let the devil get in their life and take everything they had away from them. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desire to have you that he may sift you as a wheat. I'll never forget, and one day I'll preach on all of my testimony, but I'll give you a little bit of it. I'll never forget when I was younger, which ain't many years ago, I wasn't a really, really horrible kid. I wasn't, some people say, you know, there's chief among sinners like Paul was. That wasn't me, but I wasn't good either. And when I was younger, everything was doing good. My mom was in church. My dad was in church. My brothers and sisters, we all went to church. And somewhere along the line, something happened in my family's life with my dad. He got addicted uh, uh, to heroin. 
He got addicted to heroin, changed everything in my life. And I want to tell you this, parents and families, uh, that the devil does not have to pick on you to destroy your life. Uh, the devil is, is, like I said, he's smart. He can pick somebody on somebody else close to you and it'll get to you. And when my dad began to struggle with his addiction, uh, uh, thankfully now he's, he's recovering, he's doing better as far as getting away from them, them people and that lifestyle is doing a great job. But back then it was tough, man. I mean, dad would steal from us. He'd take from us and then he'd run and leave for several weeks at a time and then show up like everything was okay. It, it, it warred with the inside of my soul. Before then, I mean, at five years old, I stood behind a pulpit and preached the first time. I mean, I'd anoint people, pray over people. I mean, I was just, I mean, I was a Holy Ghost in small form. The devil, I believe, looked at that little five-year-old boy and said, if I don't do something in his life, he's going to grow up and do something great for the Lord. I better start planning now. My son's five years old, my daughter's four years old, and I believe right now that the devil's planning something in their life. You're young and he, yeah, they may be young, but the devil's planning against them. You better protect them, mom and daddy, because they're going to get them if you ain't careful. I remember very vaguely, man, I slowly started leaving the scene of church. I didn't want it anymore. It just wasn't attracting to me anymore. And the devil's plan was slowly working in my life. I went to, to, to a school and, and befriended some guys that I probably shouldn't have had. When I was in there and we mixed up in a group, man, they, 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 they started doing things they wasn't supposed to. And I was friends with them, so I said, well, you know, might as well. At that point in time, I was frustrated at home. I was frustrated at school. I was frustrated at work, or at, at uh, church. Everything I did, I was frustrated in. And the devil had just laid it out perfectly that at that time, those boys would be doing that, and I just fell right in line with it. It wasn't too much later, and me and a couple guys around the neighborhood in Mariposa Road, man, we, we, was, we was selling stuff, doing stuff, young in high school. And I sit there, and, and as time went on, and I got deeper and deeper and deeper in sin. And the way we, where our house was built, it was, uh, had a basement and full basement. And when we moved into the house, they stuck me in the side room and under the basement. Didn't have no walls or, or had walls. It just had a door, no windows, nothing. And, and I'd go to church because Mama still went to church. And then whether I liked it or not, she dragged my rear end to church. Amen. She dragged me in and I'd get mad. You can ask my wife. She remembers seeing me back there on that back pew just as mad as a hornet because I had to come. I would go out that Saturday night, stay up all night, do things I wasn't supposed to do, and then come in and have to drag myself in the church. I was frustrated. I was mad. I didn't want no part of it. But through that, my mama forcing me and making me go to church, I still had to sit on that pew and listen to that preacher preach. And he'd preach. I, I'm telling you what, Mac, man, he'd preach on hell. He'd preach on sin. He'd preach on everything you better not do. And man, right about the time he'd get to where the part where he'd have to give an altar call, I'd use the bathroom. I'd get up out of that place. Because I didn't want to be there. But when the Holy Ghost shows up and that preacher starts preaching what God wants him to, it'll convict your heart. But I was so drawn in by the desire of Satan. I didn't want to leave that life. I wanted to rest myself in it. As much as I knew I needed to get saved, as much as I knew I needed to get out of that lifestyle and get in the church, there was something that just pulled me back in, and I didn't want to leave it. Man, I, I, I got to the point where, where the conviction was so strong, and I, I laid there on the bed that night, and, and, and Dad had been gone. He had took everything we had. He had been gone for several weeks, and he came back. And I sit there in the basement of my home, man, and, and he came through the door, and I heard it when it shut. You can hear the footsteps if you ever live in the basement. Hear the voices. I knew it was him. If you spoke in the house, that the, the voice would travel through the vents. And I sit there in the basement, and Mom and Dad begin to argue and fuss, and he, he'd be still somewhat uh, on his little binge and just be mad at everything. Man, glasses would be busting, and they'd be tussling up there and, and hollering and yelling at each other. And I said to myself before he ever came back through that door, I said, Lord, I'm done with it. I'm not going to hang out with them guys. I'm going to leave that. I'm just going to leave it behind. I won't talk to them. I'm going to start going to church because I want to. 
I'm going to go down there. When he preaches, he'll give the altar call this time. I'll go to church. I'll get saved. I done planned it all out. I was going to leave it all. About the time I said that, that's when he came walking through the door. I'm going to tell you something. If you think you're going to get to church, if you think you're going to get saved, it's not an easy path. The devil's going to fight you tooth and nail. If you're trying to get somewhere in your spiritual walk, if you want to improve yourself, if you're trying to do what God called you to do, it is not going to be an easy path. It's not a say a prayer and just do it. It's going to be hard. The devil's going to fight you every step of the way, but you've got to make a determination in yourself. You ain't going to let him stop you. Well, I was up under there, man. I mean, just that, that day at school, it's a Friday night at that school. Some of my buddies were going out to... Uh, a party at a friend's house and they invited me to go and I said no I ain't I don't want to go and they kind of looked at me you know cock eyed but I, I just didn't want to go I wanted to try to slowly distance myself from them I had the plan I was going to leave it all and man as, as, the, as the cussing and the hollering and the bicking and, and, the, and the glass busting and, and that fight was just I just got I just did not want to be in that basement and man, I'll tell you, it's just as surreal as it is right now as it was then. The devil climbed up on that bed I was in in that basement and he said, son, it'd be a whole lot better if you was at that party and not in this mess right now. Right then and there, the devil began to have me again. I was almost on my way out the door. He drew me back in. I got up, I put my clothes on, I went to the party, did things I wasn't supposed to and and to tell you all this to get to where I need to want to go. The fellers that, that were hosting that party, there was another guy that was coming in that was supposed to be bringing the drugs. The drugs he brought in was a guy who lived next door to that he just robbed his house. And me and that boy and the guy who hosted the party was walking on Mariposa Road to get back to the house. And when we did, there was a car drive up to the top of the hill at night and cut his lights off, stuck outside the car and started shooting down at the hill at us. And I'm going to tell you right now, I, 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 I wasn't as big as I was then. I was thin. I about ran as fast as I could. I was in shorts at about 1.30 at night, and I was running about as fast as I, I thought I was going to die and go to hell right there. And as I was running, man, them, the sounds of that gun was like a cannon. And, man, it hit right off the asphalt, and I could feel the shards of that asphalt hitting the back of my leg. The bullets were so close, and I was, I was running. I said, God, if you'll just give me an opportunity, if you'll just give me a chance to leave this place I'm in, I won't let the devil get me. I'll go back to church. I'll get in there, God, but don't let me die in the state that I'm in and bust hell wide open. I don't want to die. Went back to there, cut around the bush, ran through the woods, come in the back side of my home. I ran down there and I crushed my head in that pillow and I bawled myself to sleep that night. I didn't want to live it no more. The devil had had me. I'd lived his life and I was absolutely done with it. Let me tell you this now. You may, I don't know what season in your sin you are, but it's pleasurable now. But sin has a consequences and sooner or later you're going to have to pay up. It'll drag you so far where you're miserable. It'll drag you so deep you think you can't get out. But I'm going to tell you this. There's a process to this. There's the plan of Satan, but there's the process of sifting. Preacher, why? Well, look, look what the Bible says. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now the Lord could have said anything else, Terry, but he said wheat. I'm a King James Version Bible guy because wheat's supposed to be in there. I was studying this thing out and I was watching some TV shows and got me started Googling on there and I found out some stuff about wheat. Now, they don't do it like this nowadays because technology and machinery. But back then in the day, the way they sifted wheat was a process to it. And they would cut that wheat down and they'd stuff it inside of a bag as tight as they could and they'd tie the top of it. Normally I have a demonstration for it, but I didn't get all of it. But what they'd do is they'll tie it and they'd put it on the feathering floor. And they'd get a big old stick, man, and they would beat the mess out of that bag. Preacher, what are they trying to do? On, the, on that wheat, the, the, the part, the grain is inside of a nut. It's inside of a shell. And to get to that thing, you have to beat on it as hard as you can. 
What the devil does, the reason why he says he wants to have you is so that he can take your life and stuff you in that bag, put you on that feather and floor, and there he begins the process of sifting. He'll begin to beat your life, and it may seem all right at first, but when the beating continues and he hits harder and he hits harder in your life, you'll begin to be busted on the feather and floor. I told you, it's pleasurable now, but sooner or later you're going to have to pay up. The devil's drew you in and drew you in, and you're okay with it now, but you're going to wake up one morning and your whole world's going to be wrecked. And you're going to wish you never would have went down that path. The old saying is, that sin, it'll take you farther than you want to go, it'll cost you more than you're willing to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you're willing to stay. It's the process of sifting. After they take that thing and they absolutely beat it just about as hard as they can, they open up that bag and they pour it into buckets or boxes, whatever they have with them. There'll be two of them. They'll pull all the substance inside of that bucket. And they'll go outside when it's a real windy day. They'll sit that empty bucket there and they'll get that bucket with all the weed in it and they'll begin to pour it in. Then when that one's all left, they'll pick that up and they'll pour it again. Each time they transfer inside of that bucket, that wind blows. And all the light stuff gets blown away and the grain falls down inside that bucket. What they're trying to do is after they have beat it, they're now getting it to its lowest form. To where it's absolutely hardly nothing. You know what the devil's doing in your life? That process of sifting. He's been beating on you. He's been beating on you. And you got that out of protection. It's, it's, it's pleasurable right now. But then he begins to toss you to and fro. And sooner or later, sin has got you to abs- where you're absolutely nothing. Down to your lowest form, laying on the floor with your back broke by sin. It's his desire. It's, it's, it, 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 I'll say this, before you can ever be saved, you must be lost. Saved person can't get saved. You have to be lost. The devil is going to do these things to you. The Bible says that man is just, when he's born, he's just a few days, then he's full of trouble. Sin was buried and born in the heart of every single child because of the sin in the garden. And the devil has been using that against people ever since then and he draws them in. He has a plan against your life and he's going to do the process of sifting. Preacher, why? Why me? Why, why, why is he doing this to me? It's very simple. Because not only does the devil have a plan for your life, but the Lord does too. You may not see it now. When I was out there doing stuff on Mariposa Road, I shouldn't been there. I didn't, I didn't see me pastor in a church. I didn't see me preaching. If you'd have told me, I'd have laughed at you. I didn't see me doing that. But this morning, I don't care who you are, where you come from, what you used to do, or things you've done, God has a plan for you. He's got a call for you, and he's going to instill it. The Bible says that he, that he formed me, he knew me in my mother's womb. Before I even experienced this earth, God knew who I was going to be, what I was going to do, and what he called me to be. Moses, he was, he was called, ordained to lead God's people out of bondage. And sure enough, when, they, when Moses was, gave the word in the burning book, Moses said, well, Lord, I can't even speak. I can't even speak. How do you want me to speak all these people? I've got trouble speaking. Well, Lord says, all right, if it bothers you that much, bring Aaron with you. He'll help you speak. You'll find out that not one time in the life of Moses did Moses ever have to get Aaron to come speak for him. When God will call you, he will equip you, and he will ordain you, and the devil knows what, what the Lord has in your life, and he's trying to fight it. Show me that in the scripture, preacher. All right, I will. Look in verse number 32 at the end of it. But I pray for thee that thy faith fail thee not, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That's doctrine right there. How's that, preacher? Because Peter, and you know after this, he says, Lord, I'll go with you all the way. And he said, well, you know, you're going to deny me three times and cross and crow and all that happens. Peter turns his back on the Lord. 
He denies him and then he goes out and he weeps bitterly. He finds himself warming himself by the enemy's fire. He has completely walked away from the Lord. But the Lord brings him back. And in the book of Acts, at the very beginning of it, we find that they're all gathered together in the upper room. And Peter, while they're there, he, he, the Bible says he turns and faces the eleven and he preaches to them. And when he preaches, the Holy Ghost of God sent down. Now read this. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter was the tool, he was the object, he was the instrument that God was going to use to instruct the Holy Ghost to come down, to strengthen his brethren in a very time of need where Christians had to come together. And there Peter preached, and there Peter helped the, the Holy Ghost to come down, the Holy Spirit to come. The devil knew that Peter was going to be used for that. The devil knew that was his instrument, that was God's man. He knew Peter had a call on his life and the devil said, I've got to stop it. The devil knows the plan is for your life. The Lord's instructed it. He's ordained it and he knows what you're going to be. God's going to use you great one day and the devil's going to do everything he can to stop it. That's why he's on you. That's why he's doing it. He does not want you to be that preacher. He does not want you to be that singer. He don't want you to be that teacher. He don't want you to be that one that tells young people about Jesus. He don't want you to be that one that goes to people at work and tell them about the gospel. He does not want you to be used by the Lord. He's going to do everything he can to stop you. You say, preacher, this message is depressing. Preacher, you're telling me everything that the devil's going to do. You're telling me everything the devil's done in your life. How he's going to beat us. How he's going to bring us to our Lord's form. He's going to sift us. Jesus even told Peter when they aren't converted, to be converted, that means you got to walk away. Peter even told, or Jesus even told Peter that he was going to walk away from him. You may even walk away. You may even be away from him. Yeah, you in church this morning. What about when the, when the devil starts his plan on you? You know how many, you know how many people I know right now that started in church, and they're not in church. A lot of them. My family, her family, friends of ours, the devil attacked their life while they were some of the strongest Christians I knew. A man I looked up to out of church today. Deacons I knew out of church today. The devil is fighting. But I can imagine Peter, Terry, I, I mean, I'm just imagining here. Peter is, right now in his ministry, is on like a spiritual high. He's at a peak point in his ministry. Peter has done so many great things for the Lord. He's, he's helped with miracles. I mean, he's preached. He, I mean, he's done a lot of great things. And what if I came up to you after... Let's just say I, you're at the peak of your spiritual walk with the Lord. And I came up to you and said, hey, you're going to walk away from the Lord and, and, and the devil's going to fight you. You're just going to walk away from him. You're going to be like, well, preacher, what's, that ain't fair. I, I'm, a, I'm at the, the top of my spiritual life. I'm at the peak of it. What do you mean I'm going to walk away? Peter's probably thinking the same thing. Lord, what are you talking about? I just helped you with miracles just back there. I'll go all the way with you, Lord. I don't, I'm not going to walk away from you. Let me, let me warn you on something. When the devil starts, you'll end up places you never thought you'd end up. Doing things you never thought you'd do. Being in places you never thought you'd be. But right then and there, Peter has no hope. He felt like he's done been beat down, dragged out. I mean, he's probably discouraged. By the time verse 31 comes. But I'm glad 31 ain't the ending of the conversation. Because I like it when God butts in. Look in verse 32. What's the first word in verse 32? But. <laughs> Jesus tells him this. All this is going to happen. The devil's going to fight you. But. And I'm going to give you some hope. I know I've almost drowned you. But I'm going to throw out a lifesaver for you. 
The devil is going to fight you. He is fighting you. He's going to do everything he can to stop you from getting what God wants you to be. But there's more to it. You ain't, you ain't out there by yourself. You ain't out there getting beat up and, and, and getting tossed and broken your lowest form by yourself. Because I like this part. Jesus tells Peter, but I prayed for thee. Peter, I prayed for thee. Now, now Terry, if I say I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you, you appreciate that. You know, I'm sure you would. If you said you was praying for me, I'd appreciate it. But it's kind of like if I needed a favor from a company and I'd ask Terry, hey, can you get me in touch with the owner? Yeah, I'm, I got a friend that knows a friend that knows him. Okay. But if I go over here to John and I say, look, I need a favor from a man that owns this company. Oh, yeah, he's my daddy. Well, I'm going to go with John because John has direct access to him. Terry's got access to him, but his hand by hand by hand may take a little while but I still appreciate it. When I say I'm praying for you, my prayers have to go to the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost transfers over to Jesus and then Jesus transferred over to the Father. But when Jesus told Peter, I prayed for thee, it goes directly to daddy. There's no in between. It goes straight to him. Now just to get you to understand what that means, if that still don't mean nothing to you, you've got to look at previous times that the Lord has prayed. So just to give you a couple times in the scripture, New Testament, these two guys come up to Jesus. One of them's got, uh, can't talk, he's dumb, and the other one's deaf. And they come up to him and they tell him, and I, I don't know, I believe the man that couldn't talk brought the guy with him that couldn't hear to talk for him. And the guy that couldn't hear brought the guy that couldn't talk for him so he can listen. Y'all understand that when you're at the house. And they come up to Jesus and they say, uh, Jesus, you're going to have to help us. You're going to have to pray for us. I can't talk. He can't hear. And right then and there, the Bible says that Jesus lifted up his eyes toward the heavens and he prayed. And immediately when he prayed, the Bible says the string that, 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 that tied his tongue together was loosened. Right when he prayed, the very thing that kept that man from he couldn't talk was loosened and he could talk. The man that couldn't hear could hear just by him praying. If I don't get you going, let me go a little farther. You got, you got Lazarus when he was dead. Four days he's been dead. Not one, not two, not three, but four days he's been dead. In there, stinking, and Jesus shows up. And Mary Martha, the Lord, you're four days late. Should have been here four days ago. You'd have saved him. You'd have healed him. Jesus says, look, don't worry about all that. Just show me where he lays. But Lord, he stinks. Don't worry about none of that. Show me where he lays. He gets there. That's when he finds, verse 33, Jesus sweeps. When Jesus sweeps, he tells Mary and Martha, he says, you, hey, you just roll that stone away. Let me get to him. They roll that thing away. There lies a sit, door nailed dead. He's wrapped. He's bound with clothes or uh, 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 napkins and chains. Can't move. He's dead. And I believe Mary's saying, see, Jesus. I told you he's dead. Right then and there, Jesus lifts his eyes back up towards the heavens and he prays to his father. When he prays to his father, he looks down in the soul of Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And immediately, what did not have life, what was completely dead, he gets up. Jesus says, loose him and set him free. Even more than that, the next chapter over, we find Lazarus sitting at the table with a bunch of miracle people eating supper with the Lord. Preacher, what are you trying tell me. I'm telling you that the fight that the devil has against you is tough. It's hard. He's going to try to wreck you. But don't worry. Because you got Jesus that's prayed for you. It may be tough. But when you're saved and in the family of God, you've got the best person on your side. He's the cha I'm about to have a fit. He's the champion of all champions. He's never been defeated. The, de the plan the devil has against you ain't nothing compared for the prayer that Jesus has for you. If you'll just trust in him, it may be tough now, but there's a better day of coming because the Lord's prayed for you. I feel like preaching. <sighs> Have a went past 15 minutes, Tim. He knows what I'm talking about. Now, it's about to get even gooder because he said, I prayed for thee. Raise your hand if you teach English. English? All right. Question. When I say pray and prayed 
and you put ED on the end of it, what's it mean? Huh? Say it loud. All right. So if Jesus says, Peter, I pray for you, that means he ain't done it yet. That means he's about to start. But Jesus tells Peter, Peter, I have prayed for you. <laughs> that's whole, that's totally different. NIV, New Idiot Version would have said, I pray for you. But he said, I have prayed for you. Preacher, what does that tell me? That tells me before that day even came, Jesus was praying. Before Peter even knew that the devil was, was, devil was fighting, Jesus was praying. I say it like this. While, while the devil is roaming around your life, he's seeking to devour you, to sift you as wheat, to destroy you so you can't get to your calling. And the devil has started beating on you and tossing you to and fro. And the weight of that pressure is on you somewhere in the distance before it did. The devil even started. Before the devil even thought about it, Jesus was somewhere back in the distance uh, on his knees in glory saying, Father, give him strength. Uh, Father, help him out. Preacher, what do you mean? Before the devil was even planning. God was praying. If that don't get your soup hot, your burner ain't on this morning. Before you even had the first trial, God prayed for you that you'd make it through it. That listen, hey, before the cancer ever came, God prayed for you. Brother Jack, before Janice ever even fell, God was praying for her. Before you ever got sick, God was praying for you. Before this church ever lost its pastor, God was praying for you. Before the... Hallelujah to God. I need about 10 more people to help me out. When God started praying, the devil didn't even thought about working. I pray for you that thy faith fail thee not. You know, the only thing you'll have yeah, when the devil fights you, it is not your money. The devil can take it. It is not your substances. The devil can take it. It's not the tangible things. The devil can take that. But your lowest form that the devil can bring you to, he can't take that faith. Amen. That faith will be there. Jesus says, I pray for you that your faith fail thee not. That you'll Waver the storm. There's a lot of folks this morning in closing. That as soon as he gets hard, they won't even they won't even try the Lord. They out the door and gone. It may be tough. Man, these stuff. I wouldn't even want to go to everybody. Because some of the stuff everybody's dealing with in this room. Stuff that may seem small to other people seems huge to you. Some of you got lost loved ones, family and friends. Some of you dealing with finances. Some of you may be dealing with marital troubles, job issues, school issues, home issues, personal issues. Everybody's got problems. The devil's fighting everybody. But if the devil's fighting everybody, you know what that means? That means the, the, the Lord is praying for everybody. Amen. Just waver it. Trust, if you don't ever listen to anything I tell you as your pastor, listen to this. Waver the storm. We find Peter finally takes a couple steps on water. He's doing good and he sees the waves and the lightning and everything. He begins to sink. But who was there to catch him when he sunk? The Lord. Hey, you might have been walking on the water and slowly but surely you started sinking. Don't give up. Be the hand of the Lord. Be there to save you. So we stand this morning and ask the sis, come get something on the piano. The good thing about this church is that for those of you that are saved, you got the Lord on your side. God is on your side. Greater is he that is within me than he that is in this world. But let me give a warning to you. If you're without the Lord, you're all by yourself in a really big fight. You can't overcome it without Him. 
You can't defeat it without him. You can't make it the next week without him. You think it's hard now, it's going to get even harder. But if you ain't got the Lord on your side, friend, I'll just be honest with you, you ain't going to make it. And tell you truthfully, the only reason why you made it this far is probably because you got somebody praying for you. Without a doubt, somebody was praying for me that night on Mariposa Road. Somebody was. And you've made it this far because of a mama or a daddy, a sister, a brother, aunt, uncle, cousin. Somebody been praying for you. You've made it this far. But sooner or later, their prayers can't do a whole bunch. Sooner or later, the devil's fight is going to get so tough that the only thing that stands a chance is the Lord himself in your life. Oh, Judas. Judas, you remember him? The devil had a plan for Judas. Judas had the same God Peter did. The same Lord that could have, could have delivered him out of that temptation. Judas had it. But Judas was far away from the Lord. Judas made it for a little while, but before he knew it, he was selling the Lord out for just... Just a couple pieces of silver. Enough to, enough to buy a bag of taters with is what he got to sell the Lord out. Let me give you this warning. I'm preaching two types of people in here, saved and lost. If you saved this morning, you may need some strength. What you're going through is so hard right now. You may think you might not make it. You will. May not look like it, but you will. You got God there with you. It may be tough tomorrow when this message is over with, and I'm done preaching, but he ain't he ain't left you. He'll be there. He'll stick closer than any brother. And you can get closer to him and you can pray for strength and help this morning. God will help you. But friend, if you're lost, I beg of you. Would you come? Would you get into the Father's hand? I can't tell you how many times of me preaching and giving the same invitation over and over again for people to come get saved. I give a warning that you'll never know where you'll be the next time I may see you. The next time you may see this preacher's face, it may be when you locked up in the jail cell. I'll be there for you. Next time you may see me, you may be laying on your deathbed with seconds to left. I'll be there. Well, the next time I may see you is when I'm standing over you. While you in a box. I'll be there. I'll be there. But I want to be there when you're in heaven. I don't want you to have to go down that road and find yourself in a jail cell, find yourself in, on a hospital bed, or find yourself leaving this walk of life without the Lord because I'm going to tell you something. There's a real devil. There's a real Jesus. There's a real heaven. There's a real hell too. He told Nicodemus, the only way you can get there if you're born again. So I give this invitation to you. I'm going to ask everybody if you would, bow your heads and close your eyes.